slow down the attack, and almost invariably, time favours defenders. The decision whether to turn with the ball is determined largely by two factors. First, the area of the field. Turning with the ball is not advisable in the defending third of the field, simply because that is the part of the field where one should calculate on the side of safety rather than risk. It has to be remembered that more than 50% of all goals originate in the attacking third of the field. That simple truth means that players who risk losing possession of the ball in their defending third are likely to prove risky selections. The second consideration before turning with the ball is the level of the player's technical ability. If a player is unable to turn with the ball, then he is best advised to play it back to a supporting teammate. However, players who can turn with the ball are able to contribute more to the team in terms of direct play. All players should master two or three of the basic techniques for turning with the ball, such as the Cruyff turn, the step over technique, the inside hook, the outside hook, the stop turn, or the drag back. Turning with the ball is a vital technique and an important element in the scoring of goals. Four, by dribbling. Players who can beat opponents by dribbling are invaluable in a team since they create space and trouble where neither existed. Dribbling is such an important method of creating space that a complete section has been devoted to it in the first program of this series. Five, by movement without the ball. Space is most frequently created by players without the ball. This is not surprising since there are, at any given time, nine outfield players without the ball, whilst only one can have possession. The task for players creating space without the ball is twofold. The first is to make runs that will distract defenders in good defending positions and to lure them into less effective defending positions. The second is to make things easier for the player in possession of the ball. Movement without the ball is such an important aspect of play that, as with dribbling, we have devoted a complete section to the subject in programme one of the series. There are four particular ways in which a team can combine to create space. One, by spreading out side to side. This is one example of the many opposites in the game. A defence in retreat will funnel back towards its own goal with the primary objective of sealing off space in front of the goal from attacking players. It will happen, not infrequently, that players in this retreated position will regain possession of the ball. Having funneled back, therefore, the first requirement on regaining possession of the ball is to spread out and stretch the opposition from side to side. There are several important points to remember when spreading out from side to side. Make the decision early to move wide and spread out covering ground as quickly as possible. Wide means very wide, on the touchline. Runs should also be made at different angles and into different spaces but players should always try to keep the ball in view. The players indicated are moving into positions that are spread wide. Such positioning makes it difficult for opponents to mark players and to cover each other, making direct forward play much easier. The position in which an attacking player receives the ball should give him as wide a field of vision as possible. The ball should be passed to the player who is in the best position to exploit forward play and not necessarily the player in the most space. It must be remembered that having created space, that space can be lost again by poor control. If space has been created, the next stage is to exploit it by direct forward play. Two, by stretching opponents end to end. One of the key factors in defending well as a team is for the team to retain compactness. 
This means restricting the space between defending players in order that opponents receiving the ball will always be challenged and the challenging player will always be supported. In attack, the opposite applies. Attacking players should spread out from side to side and end to end to open up spaces between defending players which will make it difficult for them to mark opponents and to support one another. There are two simple ways to stretch opponents end to end. If a forward player moves towards the ball, the marking player has to choose either to move with him, in which case he leaves space behind him, or not to move with the attacking player, in which case space is created in front of him. Space may also be created in front of, between or behind defenders by movements away from the player with the ball. Increasingly, the modern game requires players to know when and how to move into positions in advance of the ball. If the movements are made at the correct time, they open up splendid opportunities for direct attacking play. It is important for players to know when to move into positions in advance of the ball. Maradona plays the ball forward, decides the player receiving the ball no longer needs his support and makes his movement forward to the back of defence where he receives the ball and has a shot at goal. 3. By change of direction. The better defenders are at the job of defending, the more important it is for attackers to know how to create space by changing the direction of play. Change of direction can be effective when two players cross over. The defenders are drawn together and space is created behind them. Defenders will react to two things. First, the movement of the ball. Second, the movement of opponents. Defenders will also attempt to achieve two objectives, to keep play in front of them and to make the play of attackers predictable by forcing play in one direction. The primary task of attackers is the exact opposite, to make the play unpredictable. They should also try to change the point of attack if space is not available and forward play not possible. Very often it is more difficult for defenders to position correctly on the opposite side of the field from the ball than it is for defenders in the area of the ball. Therefore long cross-field passes can be very important in attack. The technique of making long passes of anything between 30 and 60 yards is all important. Without any doubt, the ability to make long passes either forward or cross field with accuracy is a devastating technical weapon in the armoury of any player and any team. Reverse passes are also useful in changing direction. The technique involves running with the ball in one direction and then passing in the opposite direction. 4. By one touch play. To play at the highest level, teams must have the ability to play accurate one touch football. The nearer one gets to the opponent's goal, the more restricted space is likely to be, and the more important the need for one touch football. The more a team practices and improves one-touch play, the more players will increase their ability to see and recognise situations quickly. Their ability to select the best pass and make the decision early. And the more they will increase their accuracy and confidence. Confidence comes with accuracy, and accuracy comes through correct practice. When a team has the capacity to deploy all the various individual techniques and team methods for creating space, they become formidable. 
Teams that win championships also exploit the space created. It is a statement of fact that soccer matches are won in the attacking third of the field. But some would argue that the creative play leading to the goals often takes place in the middle or defending thirds of the field. That argument is not supported by the facts. Let us look at our sample of 109 matches involving six countries, all of which have either won the World Cup or been runners-up over the last 20 years. Apart from the Liverpool matches, all are either World Cup or European Cup internationals at senior, under-21 or under-16 levels. In the case of Liverpool, a random selection was made of championship and cup matches played between 1984 and 1988. Each of the sample batches of games yielded these totals of goals. We analysed the play leading up to every goal and noted where each of the moves began. The results showed that only 36 goals, 17.8%, actually originated in the defending third of the field. 60 of the goals, 29.7%, originated in the middle third. But overall, the figures show that 106 out of the 202 goals, 52.5%, were scored from passing movements that originated in the attacking third of the field. If we look at the six finals of the World Cup between 1966 and 1986, we find that even at this, the very pinnacle of world soccer, and over a period spanning 20 years, the results are remarkably similar. Out of a total of 27 goals, only six, 22.2%, were scored from moves that started in the defending third of the field, and seven goals, 25.9%, came from moves started in the middle third, but 14 goals, 51.9% resulted from moves that started in the attacking third of the field. It is essential to recognise the significance of this strategic fact. The overwhelming majority of all goals result from movements that originate in the attacking third of the field. It should be understood that if a team having lost the ball in the attacking third of the field, as a strategic policy, retreats rather than challenges to win back the ball, then that team will not only distance themselves from their opponent's goal, but they will also distance themselves from victory. This is one of the two misplaced strategic concepts that have contributed more than anything else to a reduction in goal scoring over the last 30 years or so. The other misplaced concept is of course that of possession football and high consecutive passing movements. Why should more than 50% of all goals originate in the attacking third? And is this figure likely to change? The key to both questions is direct play. And as we look for the explanation, it becomes clear that the figure will certainly increase as more teams take on board direct play as a strategic concept. It is a fact that the greatest source of goals is a combination of set plays and regain possessions immediately following set plays. The vast majority of these goals originate in the attacking third of the field. Most set plays in the attacking third of the field are also the result of direct play and come from passing, particularly to the back of the defence, or dribbling, crossing or shooting. Furthermore, the more important and closer the game, the more likely it is that the crucial goals will come from one of two things, either set plays or regain possessions immediately following a set play. Evidence to support this can be found in the six World Cup finals between 1966 and 1986. 
In those six matches, there were 254 set plays in the attacking third of the field. Of these, 232 were won from five consecutive passes or less, an overall percentage of 91.3. In the six games, 51.9% of all the goals originated in the attacking third of the field, and 66% of all the goals originated from a combination of set plays and regained possessions immediately following set plays. During set plays in the attacking third, teams will increase their numerical presence in that area of the field. Eight or even more players is not uncommon. This increase in numbers will result not only in more goals from set plays, but will also make it more difficult for defenders to clear from set plays. This accounts for the increased number of regained possessions following set plays in the attacking third of the field. There is little doubt that a large number of goals stem from a lack of mental concentration on the part of defenders. When are these lapses in concentration likely to occur? 1. When the game stops and is then restarted. Some players only concentrate when the ball is in play. When it goes out of play, they stop concentrating. When play restarts, this lapse in concentration leads to poor marking and the conceding of goals when the ball changes hands. When a team is defending, there is a moment of danger that occurs when the ball is won. The danger is that the players, and especially the player in possession of the ball, will often relax concentration and lose the ball. The more often the ball changes hands, the more opportunities there are for players to lose their concentration. The fact is that in the strategy of direct play, the ball changes hands more frequently than in the strategy of possession football. Furthermore, in the strategy of direct play, the ball is likely to be lost more frequently in the attacking third of the field than it is with possession football. 3. When fatigue sets in. Here, Liverpool demonstrate what can happen when fatigue sets in. When players become tired, there is a greater risk of their losing concentration. Even their will to achieve may be diminished. This is not surprising, as in any walk of life, the will to win is put to the test under conditions of physical and mental stress and adversity. Even the very best teams can be affected. The faster the tempo of the game, the more likely it is that players will tire. Direct play will increase the tempo of the game, so teams that are physically unprepared for such a contest will struggle. Fatigue will not only sap their powers of concentration, but also their judgment and technical proficiency. The statistics relating to goal scoring from set plays, and especially from regained possessions immediately following set plays, contain a clear strategic message. Once a team has the ball in the attacking third of the field, they should aim to keep it there by making it as difficult as possible for defenders to clear the ball. The strategy is based on keeping the team as a unit as compact as possible and thereby avoiding it being stretched. If a team is compact, there will be little space between players. Therefore, wherever the ball is, there will always be a player there to challenge and that player will always be supported. This strategy ensures that opposing players are constantly under pressure and frequently forced into making mistakes. Upon gaining entry into the attacking third of the field, it is important for attacking players to retain and, if possible, increase the momentum of the attack. It frequently happens when the momentum of the attack is slowed that defenders recover from poor positions into good ones. This changes the object of the attack from one of penetration to one of retaining possession. 
as possession is usually retained by playing the ball backwards and square, the result will invariably be that the initiative is lost. Eventually, the ball also will be lost without a threat on goal. When the momentum of the attack is increased in the attacking third, defenders are forced to play under pressure. This pressure derives from lack of time and lack of defenders in the right positions. There are two basic situations from which possession of the ball will be regained. One, immediately following a set play. When organising to attack at a set play, two factors must be taken into account. First, the support organisation for the delivery of the ball to provide the best scoring chance direct from the set play. Second, the support organisation to give the best chance of regaining possession of the ball if the defence should clear the delivery from the set play. We will look at both of these factors in detail in the section dealing with attacking at set plays. There are three particular situations that should be recognised. From crosses. Crosses played early to the back of the defence really present no problem in terms of regaining possession. Even if an attacking player is not first to the ball, at the very least, the defender should be placed under strong physical pressure. Sometimes the cross will not go to the back of the defence. And sometimes it will be deeper and of a higher trajectory than was intended. Two factors now become important. First, attackers should ensure that defenders are not allowed to clear the ball without strong challenge. The stronger the challenge, the weaker the clearance. In this situation, it is possible to predict the area in which the ball will land. This is known as the anticipation area. One or preferably two players should be moving into that area in anticipation of the defensive header. The header will be through an angle of about 45 degrees and the maximum distance is unlikely to be more than 20 yards. Here the ball is cleared from the far post area. The two attacking players have a considerable advantage in moving to meet the ball. Their ability to volley the ball is of technical importance. If the headed clearance is made from the mid-goal area, the anticipation area is more centrally placed. The area is still determined through an angle of about 45 degrees and the distance will be a maximum of 20 yards or even less if the challenge from the attacking player is good. Again, the attacking players move towards the anticipation area to regain possession of the ball. If the headed clearance is at the near post, then the ball will certainly be played wide and possibly out of play for a throw-in. The area where the ball is likely to land will be near to the player who crossed it. He will probably be the attacking player best positioned to challenge to regain possession of the ball. The important thing to keep in mind regarding all clearances in and around the penalty area, whether from head or foot, is that defenders will want to clear the ball with height, distance and width in that order. Effective challenge will frustrate those objectives. Less height means less time for the defence, whilst less distance and width means more danger from any regained possession. Clearance is headed from long forward passes. Long forward passes are usually intended for the space behind the defender. Inevitably, on occasions, these passes will fail to reach the target area. The worst thing that can happen to such a pass is that a defender will be allowed to move forward to meet it. In such a circumstance, good headers of the ball can propel it enormous distances and they can pick their target.
However, if the defender can be made to run back towards his own goal before trying to jump and head the ball in the opposite direction, he will lose power in his header. His body momentum will be moving in the wrong direction to exert force on the ball. If at the same time he's being challenged, clearing the ball will be extremely difficult. Here is a typical example of what is likely to happen. Attacking player number seven has played a long forward diagonal pass aiming at the space behind the defender. Attacking player number 11 has run into the space to receive the pass. However, the defending player has moved back and intercepted the pass with a header. The header lacks power and direction and will fall in an area of rather less than 45 degrees to the defender and at a distance from him of between 10 and 12 yards. Attacking player number 8 has moved into the anticipation area to regain possession of the ball. Number 11 must readjust his position and move on side. Number 8 must be capable of passing the ball on his first touch or controlling it at speed. For this situation he should be equipped with the skills of running with the ball, dribbling and shooting. The playing of long forward passes over the heads of defenders is regarded by certain purists as not good football. It is excellent football and should be encouraged. It is also a vital element in the strategy of direct play. It is important to position and anticipate possible clearances from set plays. It is equally important to position and anticipate clearances from forward and diagonal passes. From passes to the back of the defence when the defender is first to the ball. In any situation where a defender is made to turn, there are potential problems. The first rule is that the defender should not be allowed the space in which to turn and pass the ball forward. The second rule is that, if possible, the safety route back to the goalkeeper should be sealed off. Here, a pass has been made to the inside of the defender, to the back of the defence, for the blue attacker number 11 to receive in space. But the defender is first to the ball. Immediately, the number 11 must pressure him and prevent him from turning with the ball. Likewise, number 9 must react quickly and seal off the route back to the goalkeeper. With both of these objectives achieved, the defender with the ball now has a problem. The likelihood is that he will play the ball out for a throw-in or for a corner. Even if he did have the space to turn, the number 11 would still be required to challenge him to stop him from passing the ball forward without difficulty. Number 9-2 should still ensure that the safety pass back to the goalkeeper is sealed off. The essence of all these tactics is teamwork and compactness. Good teamwork is not possible without compactness, and compactness is not possible without a high work rate. Situations will arise where players need help, and the nearest player to him should not be too far away to give it. More detail is to be found on this subject in the section on key factors in defending. Direct play is guaranteed to produce more of all the types of situations described in this section. Exploiting these situations by playing well, both as individuals and a team, will increase the number of regained possessions in the attacking third of the field. It is important to remember the key statistic. 52.5% of all goals originate in the attacking third of the field. The most important factors in winning and losing games are set plays and regained possessions immediately following set plays. Around 50% of goals derive from a combination of those two factors. The analysis of the goals in our 109 match sample showed that out of a total of 202 goals scored, 92, 45.5%, resulted either direct from a set play or from an immediate regained possession following a set play. 
more detailed investigation revealed that of these goals, 84, 91.3%, came from set plays that were won from moves of five consecutive passes or less. A similar trend is to be found in the statistics from the six World Cup finals. Of the total 27 goals, 18 resulted from a set play or from an immediate regained possession following a set play. 17 of the 18 goals, 94.4%, came from set plays that were won from five consecutive passes or less. This is remarkably similar to the percentage revealed in the 109 match sample and also supports the theory that the more important the game, the more important becomes the role of set plays. The importance of direct play is quite obvious when we come to analyse the passing movements immediately prior to the winning of set plays. In the 109 match sample there was a total of 2,112 set plays won in the attacking third of the field. Of these the overwhelming majority were won from five consecutive passes or less, 1,880 or 89%. 232, only 11%, were won from six consecutive passes or more. In the World Cup final sample, there were 254 set plays won in the attacking third. Of these, 8.7%, 22 set plays, came from six consecutive passes or more. But the number of set plays following on from movements of five consecutive passes or less was 232, a remarkably similar percentage to the 109 match sample, 91.3%. There can be no doubt, therefore, of the importance of direct play when it comes to the winning of set plays. There can equally be no doubt of the importance of set plays and regained possessions immediately following set plays in the winning of games. Here, the England team move into their pre-planned positions in preparation for a long throw-in in the six-yard box. There are five basic situations. One, passes to the back of the defence. Passes to the back of the defence are always likely to cause problems for defenders. A defender will not feel comfortable if he's having to turn and run in the general direction of his own goal. His actions will be dominated by thoughts of safety. top of the safety priority list will be to pass the ball back to his goalkeeper. This can be risky. If the route to the goalkeeper is blocked, there are two choices. The first is to attempt to turn with the ball. But this will require either plenty of space or a high level of technique, as well as colossal risk. The second choice is to play the ball dead for a throw-in or corner. This is what defenders should do if in doubt. Risks should not be taken in the defending third of the field. 2. Blocked crosses or crosses to the back of the defence. Crosses to the back of a defence will cause problems for any defender. Having to clear such a cross, a defender moving back towards his own goal will settle for giving away a corner kick. Attackers on the flank should take a chance and try to get the cross in early. If the cross is blocked by a defender, the ball might well go out of play for a throw-in or corner. 3. Dribbling Good dribblers of the ball will always unsettle defenders. A player should be encouraged to appreciate that if he wins a set play from dribbling, then it is he and not the defender who has won the contest. 58% of free kicks and penalties result from dribbling in and around the penalty area. 4. Pressure. Pressure places a high demand on good technique. Certain defenders may consider their level of technique to be unequal to the demands. Frequently, this leads to uncertainty, even panic, and the conceding of set plays. 5. Shooting The more opportunities for shooting that are accepted, the greater number of byproducts leading to goals. There are two essential byproducts of shooting. 
rebounds and corners. A major byproduct of direct play is an increased number of set plays. The major byproduct of an increased number of set plays is an increased number of goals. That fact is incontrovertible. But why is this so? One, the ball is dead. Therefore, the circumstances present the lowest level of technical difficulty for the performer. Two, lack of pressure on the man with the ball. In the case of corners and free kicks, the nearest defending player should be at least 10 yards from the ball. Players and referees should uphold the law. In the case of a throw-in, that law does not apply, but the thrower has the considerable advantage of controlling the ball with his hands. 3. The placement of large numbers of players in pre-planned attacking positions. Set plays provide attacking teams with the opportunity to place eight or more players in or around the opposing penalty area in pre-planned positions. 4. Rehearsal. Having decided on the type of delivery, the best player to make the delivery, and the arrangement of the players, the important need is for rehearsal. With rehearsal comes a further benefit, concentration, leading to a disciplined team performance. One final point should be made concerning set plays in general. Variety is important, but it must be variety on a theme known to pay high dividends. There are six key factors to consider in attacking from a throw-in. 1. Take the throw quickly. If defending players lose their concentration, they should be exposed as quickly as possible. 2. Throw to an unmarked player. If there is an unmarked attacking player, he will usually be the best person to receive the ball. Three, throw the ball forward. In accordance with the principles for direct play, unless the ball is thrown to an unmarked player, it should be thrown forward. Four, Throw for ease of control or for a one-touch pass. A throw-in is in fact a pass. The ball should be thrown at a pace and at an angle that will demand the minimum of control from the receiving player. It should also make it as difficult as possible for the defender to challenge for the ball. Five, create sufficient space to make the throw effective. Players should create space to make forward movement possible, both with and without the ball. Six, try to get the thrower back into the game. The thrower should not consider his task to be finished once he has thrown the ball. He may be in space to receive the ball, or he may create a numerical advantage in the area of the ball. The long throw in the attacking third of the field. The long throw is especially dangerous and all teams should develop at least one specialist player for the long throw. The best and most effective type of long throw is of a fast and low trajectory. The target should be the area of the near post. The target man positioned at the near post should be tall and a good header of the ball. 
he should be especially good at flicking the ball on into the mid-goal area or to the area of the far post. The organisation should give support through 180 degrees with attacking players positioned to attack all vital areas and to challenge for any partial clearance. Here the ball is thrown to a player who is supported through 180 degrees by five teammates. Number nine attacks the vital space of the mid-goal area. Number 11 attacks the vital space of the far post area. The thrower follows his throw in order to both support the player receiving the ball and also to challenge for any partial clearance in that area. Here, Nottingham Forest capitalise on a partial clearance from Liverpool. More goals are scored from free kicks than from corners and throws combined. It is important to keep things simple. The less complicated the play, the greater the likelihood of success. One, outside the attacking third of the field. There is no need for set moves. Simplicity and direct play are the essential ingredients along with the need to cover the area of the far post for deflections and miscued shots. Two, in the attacking third of the field. On the flanks. The principle of playing the ball to the back of the defence is paramount. The delivery of the ball should be with in-swing and in-spin towards the goal. The line of the kick should be aimed at the front half of the goal. This means a left-footed kick from the right flank and a right-footed kick from the left flank. Defenders, therefore, will find themselves turning and moving towards their own goal, trying to clear a ball played behind them that is spinning and swerving away from them. Here, a ball has been played with in-swing and in-spin over the head of one defender into the space behind the other three defenders who now have to turn and try to clear a ball swinging and spinning away from them. Attacking players must always challenge defenders and to ensure that they are first to the ball in order to deflect it towards goal. In this example, the attacking players challenge the defenders at the very least, they will force the defenders to defend under heavy pressure and they will also have a considerable numerical advantage if rebounds occur in and around the six-yard area. Care should be taken not to send too many players forward to attack the back of the defence. Preferably two attacking players should be positioned on the edge of the penalty area to deal with partial clearances. Our analysis reveals that this procedure for taking free kicks from flank positions in the attacking third is the most lethal. When the delivery and organisation are correct, the success ratio is as high as one in five. For free kicks on the flank, that figure is quite substantial. In and around the D. If a free kick is awarded in or around the D, it is a certainty that the defending team will erect a wall to block part of the goal. The purpose of the wall is to protect part of the goal from a driven shot. Obscuring the goalkeeper's view. This is easily accomplished by using one or two attackers to complete the defensive wall, thus blocking the whole of the goal. The attacking team have placed two of their players to complete the wall. They are allowed to be less than 10 yards from the ball, whereas the defenders must be not less than 10 yards from the ball. A small gap has been deliberately left outside of the attackers in the wall and inside the post for the possibility of a direct shot at goal.
The two attackers in the wall should stand close to each other with their feet close together. Otherwise, the goalkeeper will be able to see the ball. The attackers must not break from the wall until after the kick is taken. Then they should both spin round and converge on the goal, attacking the ball if there is a rebound. Challenging, defending players not involved in the wall. For challenging, defending players not involved in the wall, the same principle applies equally in central positions as it does on the flanks. Defenders must be made uncomfortable and pressure from the attackers will certainly achieve this. Defending teams are likely to withdraw all 11 players to defend against free kicks in the D. Therefore, attacking teams can afford to send nine players forward, including the kicker. They should position close to each defender who is marking space to the side of the wall. Defenders do not like being treated in this way. They will feel uncomfortable and defend less well as a result. Here, all the defenders outside the wall are marked. Following the kick, number four and the kicker will retain their positions to deal with rebounds to the edge of the penalty area. The other attackers should all converge on the six-yard area once the kick has been taken. Penalties are always important, and many competitions are now decided on penalty shootouts. The kicker must place the ball himself. Other attacking players should follow the kick in for possible rebounds. These players must not encroach into the D or the penalty area until the kick has been taken. There are two methods of taking a penalty. The first is to place the ball low into either corner of the goal. The second is to blast the ball and beat the goalkeeper by sheer pace. If in doubt, go for pace. The most effective type of corner kick is the inswinger. Of all goals from corners, 67% come from inswingers. Accuracy of the kick and variation upon the in-swinging theme are essential for success. The team organisation must support the corner kick and maximise its quality. For this right flank corner, a blue attacker, number five, is positioned at the near post. His job is to move out towards the ball and, if it is low in flight, to flick it on across the goal. He needs to be tall and able to perform well under physical pressure. Number nine is positioned near to the goal line inside the near post. As the kick is taken, he should move out towards the edge of the six-yard area. From that position, he can attack any ball entering the area below bar height. His movement is out towards the edge of the six-yard area and then possibly back in again to attack the ball. Some may wonder why he does not position himself on the edge of the six-yard area in the first place. There are two reasons. In his position on the goal line inside the near post, he and the player marking him will obstruct the goalkeeper's view. Also, he will be more likely to achieve space by movement than by remaining static. He must also be tall and a good header of the ball. At times he will head for goal, but sometimes it will be more useful to head across goal towards the far post. The task of number seven is similar to that of number nine, but his starting position is in the back half of the goal. His movement out from goal towards the edge of the six-yard area must permit him to watch the ball all the time. If the ball is flicked on, he must be looking to attack it. The task of number 11 is critical. More goals are scored in the area of the far post than most people realise. He must position to move in to attack that vital area. If the ball is flicked on by either attacker or defender, there will almost certainly be a scoring opportunity in the region of the far post. All four players in the six-yard area should be particularly vigilant and careful not to be caught offside when the kick is outside the six-yard area or when the kick is partially cleared. The second phase of the organisation to support the kick involves four players. Number 10 is positioned on the far side of the penalty area, again for a right flank corner. From that position, he will attack the area of the far post. Number six is positioned near to the edge of the penalty area. 
From there, he will attack the mid-goal area, just outside the six-yard area. Number eight and number four will retain positions on the edge of the penalty area to deal with rebounds or partial clearances. It would be an advantage for them to be good volleyers of the ball. So nine players, including the kicker, are placed in advanced attacking positions. This arrangement is based on the assumption that the opposition will withdraw all 11 players into defensive positions. Should they elect to leave one player upfield, then either number eight or number four should withdraw into a deeper position on the edge of the attacking third of the field. Set plays and the supporting organisation to take advantage of secondary possessions following set plays combine to produce the biggest single factor in winning football matches. That is a fact, and coaches and players will ignore it at their peril. We will look at more aspects of direct play in our next programme, when we explore aspects of defending, as we continue to piece together the winning formula. Charles Hughes's book, The Winning Formula, is an ideal companion to this series of video programs. Together they comprise the most comprehensive study ever produced on the playing of association football. The book is available from bookshops or direct from this address.